find your seat. There are some loaner Bibles on the back table if you need to borrow a Bible with us this morning. And whether you're borrowing a Bible, whether you have your own, whether it's on your iPad or phone, let me encourage you to turn again to James chapter 1. As we continue through the book of James, James chapter 1. Do our desires and feelings determine who we are? Do our desires and feelings determine how we live? Is a desire to sin, sin? If not, what role, if any, do desires have when we sin? How about you this morning? What are your heart desires? Do your heart desires ever lure you into temptation? Or are your heart desires always pure and positive? You say, Pastor Greg, that's about three questions more than it takes to crash my hard drive this early in the morning. And if you're thinking that, I... Agree, that's the way I am too, but I'm asking those kinds of questions because the Apostle James touches on some of those questions and what we're about to read this morning. And so if you have James chapter 1 in front of you, follow along with me beginning with verse 13. James 1 verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted... I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Let's pray. Father God, this past week, I have just been overly conscious of the fact that I'm preaching my last few sermons before this wonderful congregation that you have blessed us with. And because of that, as as we pick up in James where we left off last time, I think it is so providential that today we're going to talk about holiness, that today we're going to talk about your desire for us to have a pure heart. Father, we confess our fickle heart. We confess our inconsistent heart. We live in a nation that has a lack of holiness in their hearts. And so, Father, this morning, my prayer is that you'll open our eyes to the plain meaning of these words so that we can walk in fresh holiness, that we could look more and more like your son, your perfect, precious son who walked in holiness. And it is in his name that we pray all of this. Amen. Well, the title of this morning's message is four observations about sinful desires. And so let me give the first observation and I believe these will be on the screen, but also you might want to refer to the back of your bulletin. The first observation that we see in James's words is that desire to sin is not sin. Again, first observation, desire to sin is not sin. As we read James 1, 13 through 15, what are these three verses really all about? Answer, the source of temptation, the progression of temptation, and then the final destination of temptation, when it is given into. That's what this passage is about. And because of that, if we look at the final destination of temptation when it is given into at the tail end of verse 15 
And if we work backwards, it's important to notice that one thing links to another, kind of like a three-link chain. These things are interconnected. And noticing that is important because the final destination of temptation given into is what, according to verse 15? Death. Again, but notice in verse 15 what comes before death. Sin. But notice what comes before sin. Desire. And so stepping back and sort of looking at all three of those connections and that three-link chain is helpful because James' point is simply telling us how temptation works. It has a starting point, it has a progression that moves forward, and then it has an ending point, which is death. Again, that's what these verses are really all about. And while getting a visual image of that helps us, there is more to it because, notice, James makes the point that these chain links are not connected unless something happens. Notice with me. Certain conditions must be met before desire turns into sin. Again, verse 15, desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. I'm reading from the English Standard Version this morning. Some of your translations use that word, when, that I I think that's very helpful. Some translations use the word after. But grammatically, what is going on with this, this word when? It, in English, it can be either an adverb or a conjunction. And so, when the word when is used as an adverb, it's denoting time. So, I, I could ask the question, when is dinner? It's used as an adverb there. Dinner is at 6.30. But when used as a conjunction, the word when is a connecting word. And so I might say a sentence like this. I got full when I ate the burger for dinner. And so notice that that puts two things together with a connection in between. As a conjunction, the word when, it, when I, the, the time I had dinner doesn't matter. That's not the point of the conjunction. The point is there's a condition that has to be met in order for me to get full. When I had the burger for dinner, I got full. And so that is actually going on here. These links are not connected unless something happens. Again, verse 15, when... Desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. I I confess that um, I do not like English grammar. It's not my cup of tea. It's tedious, it's boring. And And I apologize to any English teachers who might be hearing me say that. However, it's very helpful here. Because when we ask the question, you know, how are we able to say desire to sin is not sin? We're able to say that because of the words when, after, desire happens. Desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. Desire, when I give into it, gives birth to sin. Desire, when I succumb to it, gives birth to sin. In other words, a condition has to be met. But we could also argue the same point from a different angle. And I actually like this one better because it doesn't involve English grammar, even though the word when is important. But we could also just simply think theologically of what James is trying to communicate. Namely, the question, what does temptation do in the life of the Christian? It tests us. If we are tempted to steal money from work, 
our integrity is being tested. If we're tempted to steal money from work, our honesty is being tested. Our um, being a person of our word, our character is being tested. And we can pass that test or we can fail that test. If we are tempted to cheat on our spouse, our faithfulness is being tested. Are we going to be a person of our word? Are we, are, our love for our spouse is being tested. We can pass that test or we can fail that test. But ultimately, for the child of God, when we are tempted in any way, our faithfulness to Christ is being tested. And if the desire to sin was automatically sin, there would be no test. Faithfulness would be meaningless. Because there would be no opportunity to either pass the test or fail the test. If temptation, if desire was automatically sin, character in our hearts would be meaningless. Maturity would be meaningless. Proving our honesty would be meaningless. And so because of that, James is making it abundantly clear in these verses, particularly verse 15... That desire alone to sin is not sin. And yet, there's another point James makes that causes us to scratch our head as to how do these two observations go together. And so here's the second observation this morning. The source of sin is desire. And that's not neutral. Let me say that again. The source of sin is desire, which is not neutral. We see this in verse 13. James 1, verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. I don't know if uh, anyone here might be a fan of Johnny Cash, but even if you're not, maybe you've heard uh, his hit, Ring of Fire. It has very interesting words. It goes something like this. Love is a burning thing, and it makes a fiery ring, bound by wild desire. I fell into a ring of fire. I fell into a burning ring of fire. I went down, 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 and the flames went higher, and it burns, burns, burns. The ring of fire. The ring of fire. When that song made number one, it stayed on the charts for seven weeks straight as number one. And when we hear the words of that song, obviously one of the words that jumps out to us is that word, Desire. And in this song, desire is not described as a very positive thing, is it? It's not a neutral thing. It's describing something that causes us to fall down, 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 says the words. The flames went higher. And so this is not a positive desire that Cash is singing about. And even though the song is quite catchy, uh, if you listen to it carefully, it's not a very wholesome song. And, and some of you know why. The song was not written by Johnny Cash. It was written by his soon-to-be second wife, June Carter. And June Carter wrote it way before they were married about her love for a married man. Ironically, James, right here before us, is using the word desire in the exact same way. You see, in the English language, when we say the word desire, that word by itself, it can be good, it can be bad, it can even be neutral, depending on the context. Depending on the words that are before it, depending on the words that are after it, or in the case of Johnny and June, depending on the backstory. But that's not the case in Greek. In the Greek language, evil desire 
is a totally separate word from good desire. The word thalo, it describes a, a positive heart affection, a good desire. Or thalo can sometimes just mean a neutral desire in Greek, but it never means an evil desire. When Jesus was praying to the Father in John chapter 17, you might remember that he prayed, Father, I desire that these disciples see my glory. And because that is a positive aspiration of the heart of our Savior, John records it in the Gospels using the word thalo. It's a positive desire. But when New Testament writers want to express desire that is dark and negative and evil, they use a, another word. It's the word epithumia. And ironically, epithumia means exactly what June Carter said it means. And I could be wrong. I don't think that June was a Greek scholar. But the, the word epi in Greek means what? It means around, above, before, surrounding, overcoming, epi. And then thermos means heat, as in flames of fire. But in every case, in the New Testament, epithumia means a negative or a sinful desire. And so, for example, in Romans chapter 13, verse 14, Paul says, Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires, epithumia. John quoting Jesus in John 8, 44, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he says, you are of your father the devil and your will is to do your father's desires, epithumia. And because of that, again, looking back at James 1, 13 through 15, every time James uses the word desire, he's using epithumia. He's very deliberately talking about what? sinful desires and he doesn't even have to do this but he even includes other descriptive words like being lured or enticed there's just no getting around the fact that he means our skin to crawl as we read these words he's talking about sinful desires and I don't necessarily like that because I'm trying to apply the passage to me and I've got some good desires, and so do you. Not all of our desires are sinful. We, we can have desires to feed the poor or use our time in a sacrificial way to help others. We have good desires for certain, but those aren't the desires James is talking about. He's using every grammatical tool he can to, as it were, pull out all of the stops to say, this is wicked. These are sinful desires that we're talking about. He's being over-deliberate to say, these are desires that can go only one direction when we feed them, and that is toward what God has forbidden. These are desires that by their very definition mean, if I were to give in to it, it would immediately be sin. And so... Do a little internal test with me. Think of a desire in your heart right now. You got it? If you were to give in to that desire, would it be sin? If the answer is no, those aren't the desires James is talking about. But if the answer is yes, he's reading our mail. Those are the kind of desires he's talking about. And so this is a little bit odd because we don't want to miss the fact that he is pretty clear concerning that first observation that desire alone to sin is not sin. But then he's pretty hard on desires. The second observation is that the source of sin is desire and it's not neutral. And so, in a way, we could kind of say it like this. As James is talking about desire, 
it requires the adjective sinful without necessitating the verb sinning. We don't have to sin. Again, it it requires the adjective sinful without necessitating the verb sinning. And that leads to our third observation, which is a good observation. Sin is not uncontrollably inevitable for the child of God. Sin is not uncontrollably inevitable. Yes, in our first point, I'm thankful for what that when implies. Desire by itself is not sin. That means I do not have to be polarized in fear or condemnation just because I face temptation. Even when it's incredibly difficult temptation. Those when connections imply that the desire to sin is not sin. But those when connections imply something else. I do not have to let desire conceive and give birth. I have a say over the connection. Do you see that? I can break the chain. I do not have to give in to sin. Let me invite you to turn to Romans 6. Don't don't lose your place in James 1. You know, if, if sin was some overpowering, inevitable force then why is James giving a warning in the first place? If if sin was inevitable, then why in verse 21 does he say, you can put away wickedness? You can put away all filthiness. You see, throughout his letter, James assumes that holiness is the natural path forward for the Christian life. All throughout James, he talks about holiness. Yes, he gives warnings But he gives warning so that we can overcome something that's within us. He gives warning so that we can pass the test before us. And if you notice in Romans 6, starting with verse 6, Paul says the same thing. Romans 6, verse 6, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for one who has died in Christ has been set free from sin and so again when James says in verse 15 then desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin follow along with me James is not making a statement of what God's children are doomed to experience for the rest of their lives. He is giving a warning concerning the potency of something that's within us. The potency of sinful desire. Why is he doing that? Because James knows that that's something within us. The deck is stacked. James knows about something that we're going to talk about more next week. He knows that sinful desire is the natural disposition of our heart. And that word heart leads us to our, our fourth observation. So again, just to, just to track where we're going and where we've been so far, observation number one, desire to sin by itself is not sin. Observation number two, The source of sin is desire, which is not neutral. There's the warning. Observation number three, sin is not uncontrollably inevitable. But notice with me this fourth observation. Part of salvation is the transformation of desires. Let me say that again. Part of our salvation is the transformation of our desires desires. That's a statement that is a direct challenge to average Christianity today because so many, even within the church, have been sucked into believing that this desire within me is fine as long as I do not cross the line into sin. 
this desire within me, this epithumia that James is warning me about, it, it's fine as long as I do not give in to it. I can identify myself with this desire. I can be at home with this desire. I can accept it as long as I do not cross the line and allow myself to actually do it. But folks, if the desire we are talking about is the desire, again, remember our little litmus test, the desire that when I give in to it, it's automatically sin, then that's not fine. There is something wrong with that desire. It's, it's not neutral. It's, it's not a pet. I, I can't fondle or entertain that desire. I do not put it on a pedestal and call it my friend. You know, to, to light a match next to a bag of sugar is one thing, but to light a match next to a bag of gunpowder is quite different. And epithumia represents the gunpowder. And James is telling us that sinful desires are a powder keg of TNT. Am I the only one in this room who have entertained sinful desires and seen the explosion? No. We all have. And to be clear, when we do that, and run to Christ for forgiveness, we are immediately forgiven. And so when that happens, and it does happen, I am redeemable, you are redeemable, but let's not miss the fact that the sinful des desire is never redeemable. It can only go one direction. And let me invite you to turn to Matthew 15. As we think through those sinful desires that are what? They're, it's like a viper that's never going to be tamed. My, my, my son, Rowan, and I are watching some YouTube video of a guy who collects venomous snakes. And there's one thing about venomous snakes. They're never going to be tamed. It's just not going to happen. A Doberman can be tamed. A German Shepherd can be tamed. A Mastiff can be tamed. But not a Cobra. Not a Banded Crate. Not a horned sidewinder. And so, uh, to that common way of thinking that's even in the church today that says, this desire is fine as long as I do not cross the line into sin. You know, as you hear that, I want you to notice something very pharisaical about that statement. Because we remember that when Jesus rebuked the Pharisees, why was he rebuking them? He was rebuking them because they made a sharp separation between what was going on in their heart and what their actions did. And Jesus and James both said, you can't do that. You know, if you and I were to follow the Pharisees around for a week, do you know what we would see? We would see moral perfection. If we we're to follow the Pharisees around for a week and notice everything they did, oh, folks, don't, do not think that in their day the Pharisees were considered the, the boogeymen, the, the bad guys. Today, that's the way we think about them. In their day, they were, per they were the holiness hope for society. Why? Because they could bring down heaven with their prayers out in the city square. They gave alms to the poor. They were ritually clean in all of their washings with water. And yet, how did Jesus challenge them? Look at Matthew 15, 19. Notice, as we read this, the Pharisees were squeaky clean on the outside. Matthew 15, 19, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false, win false witness, slander. And then listen to what Jesus said. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile 
anyone. Here is what Jesus is telling us. Epithemia, sinful desires, in the heart turn to sin long before they turn to sin in physical action. That's what Jesus is saying. And so, folks, I take comfort that James clearly implies that the desire to sin is not sin. I take comfort in that. I'm thankful for that. But I'm not going to take too much comfort in that because I probably cross the line from desire to sin a lot quicker than I think I do. I probably cross the line from desire to coveting a lot quicker than I think I do. And nobody can see it because it stays right here. I probably cross the line from desire to lust a lot quicker than I think I do. You probably cross the line from desire to greed and malice and hate a lot quicker than you think you do. And all of those sins are sourced in the heart and they stay in the heart. None of you know visibly that I'm a part of it. And I don't know that you're visibly a part of it because nothing physically was crossed over any line. That's what Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for. I can identify myself with this desire. I can be at home with this desire as long as I do not cross the line and actually give in to it. What's the problem with that way of thinking? The problem is that it totally misses that Jesus is after the heart. That's the problem. And, and he's so after the heart that the heart is what he is committed to transform. And so I want you to think of Philippians 2. Look on the screen with me at Philippians 2, verse 12. I love the way the NLT says this. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. Amen. Part of salvation is the transformation of desires. Part of what the good physician is going to heal in me is how I think when I fall to sleep at night. When I lay down, what are, what's going through my mind? When, when I'm on that long stretch of road driving, what do I allow to come into here? The good physician wants to change that. He wants to transform all of us. Otherwise, Jesus would have left the Pharisees alone because they rarely, if ever, sinned physically in a way that we would see it on the outside. Now, in 2002, Johnny Cash recorded another song. This was just shortly before his death. The name of the song is Hurt. And music critics consider the song Hurt as sort of the perfect bookend to his song Ring of Fire. And the reason for that is because in the precious song Hurt, Johnny Cash openly confesses some sins and he sings about his failures to his first wife. He confesses and opens up and he sings about the way throughout his life that he had done people wrong who were very close to him. And in sort of a, an artistic repentance, Cash sings about those things and is very transparent. And uh, maybe, you know, part of the reason he was able to do that is because he did become a, a believer in Jesus Christ. He allowed Jesus to transform his heart so that he could open up about his shortcomings. And you know, this morning, whether we have given in to sinful desires physically or whether we have given in to sinful desires just in the private secrecy of our heart where no one can see 
I want to be certain about something this morning, and that is that we all leave this morning knowing that it's never too late for your version of the word hurt, of the song hurt, concerning confessing sin to God, coming clean about your shortcomings. It's, it's never too late to come to the Lord and say, this is where I've blown it. I repent. Would you forgive me? You know, we're still left with some questions in these verses. Since James was writing to Christians, and since we are Christians, this letter is for us, we're still le left asking the question, okay, so what do I do with these sinful desires? How, how long is it going to take for God to transform my desires? And so, Lord willing, that's just a touch of what we're going to cover next week. But let me just, in closing, say that while the timing and the intensity of our sinful desires might be different, while your story and struggles might be different from my story and my struggles as to the timing of God changing our desires and the intensity of them, while all of that might be true, it is critical to believe this explosively powerful principle that God is not just in the saving from hell business, he's into the change of desire business. That's for you and me. And while I may have a hard journey ahead in my desires, while you may have a hard journey ahead, if I do not believe that God's intention is to purify me from the inside out and the outside in and the inside out, if I don't believe that that's God's intention in my life, I probably will not experience a lot of it because I will align my identity with my feelings instead of aligning my identity with who Christ says I am. I'm holy. I'm holy. This morning, God does not just want your actions. He wants your heart. God does not just want your resolve to do better. He wants your heart. Father, thank you this morning for your word. Thank you this morning for the transforming power of the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. I pray even now that these words would take deep root within each one of us, whether the sinful desires are something that we have suppressed or struggled with for many years. May we not give up on your intentions towards them. Thank you that you're the good physician. Thank you that you are committed to our sanctification, to our glorification in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning?